by the rivers of Babylon. Yeah, we sat down and we cried when we remembered Jerusalem. We were sick, Lord, near to dying. Shalom, shalom, family. Welcome to another um, Torah or Tanakh review. My name is Uzi Alewi, one of the teachers of Congregation Beit Da'a Kakmabina, located in the Red Hook section of Brooklyn, New York. Our address is 382 Hamilton Avenue. Brooklyn, New York, and we're happy to be here once again. First and foremost, giving all glory to the Most High God of the universe, Jehovah Zavahot, for allowing us to be here once again, doing this um, Torah, Tanakh review, and um, just hoping that um, we're able to edify you. To those who are listening, to those online, um, I'd like to wish you all a Shabbat Shalom, or early Shabbat Shalom, and pray that the Most High God be with you all. Uh, we thank you all for allowing us to um, come into your homes and allowing us to um, teach you, teach your children, teach your family, or even, you know, just listening to us. It means a lot that you continue to come back and listen. And um, we give glory to the Most High God, and we pray that the Creator of heaven and earth will continue to be with all of you and protect you. Given Due respect to the leadership of Bay DCB, even my brother, the leader of Bay DCB, my brother, Chief Prince Yediel Ben Yassaskar, praying that the Creator be with him, be with his family and his household. I pray that the Most High God will continue to be with all of the members of the congregation here and afar, even those online, and I pray that that um, the Most High God will continue to bless each and every one of you. So uh, we're going to move straight ahead, and we're going to go right into the, into the lesson. I believe that um, Nasik will be going into Psalm 75, but before he does that, he's going to go into the um, previous week's portion um, and explain a little bit about that or, or try to enlighten us in, in some of the uh, past week's portion. So without any further ado, I introduce to you one of my teachers and one of my mentors, even Nasik, Sarisha Ben Yehuda. How are you, Nasik? Uh, great, Brother Hashem. First of all, I'd like to give praises to the Supreme Tongue Universe, God of my forefathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, and due respect to the platform on GCB platform, uh, uh, spiritual leader, Chief Prince Ariel Ben Yasaska, the host Chief Uzael, to the Prince's Chiefs, uh, Rabinet, Kony, <clears throat> uh, Maureen, and uh, uh, visitors, brothers and sisters, I greet you all in the tongue of my forefathers. Shalom Aleichem and early Shabbat Shalom. And I'd like to start off by saying, Adonai, Sephtai, Titaku, Fiyagi, Tiyotheaka, O Lord, open down my lips, my mouth shall declare thy praise. Uh, we'll be covering <clears throat> um, the Psalms that they have in relationship to this, the, 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 the Sidra that just passed, which was Ki Tisa. Um, <clears throat> Which is interesting is that from Exodus, the, the 15th chapter, for those that just focus on the chapters, to the very end of the book of Exodus, everything's about the tabernacle, the priesthood, and setting up an establishment and a sanctuary for worship. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, for, and also and the purpose of the sanctuary being that God could dwell amongst us. And you have a glitch in an episode of divine uh, planning, where you have some intercession of some, some of the most horrific actions that takes place. Um, and uh, for those that um, <clears throat> might want to read it thoroughly, you know, uh, again and go over it, because you can always find different nuances and, and points to be able to look at and consider uh, when you go over these different sidros. But <clears throat> if you, it, it starts from Exodus, the 30th chapter, the 11th verse, and it goes to the 34th chapter, 
35th verse. And the normal half Torah, if you follow uh, Ashkenazi um, custom, would be 1 Kings 18th chapter 1 to 39. Verse from 1 to 39. If you follow Sephardic chap, um, custom, then 1 Kings 18, 20 to 39. And being this, this week, this Shabbat, um, it happened to be, uh, there was a special Shabbat they call Shabbat Para, which is basically, you know, the cow, the heifer. Um, when we look at, uh, you know, and it's interesting, this usually comes up close before, you know, the, uh, right after Purim, or shortly after, or uh, close around the time that uh, Purim just passes by. Um, what we have, if you follow the, uh, the readings for it, there's a special uh, reading that uh, <clears throat> a month here might read, which would be the book of Numbers, the 19th chapter, verses 1 to 22. And the Haftorah for Shabbat Parah would be Ezekiel 36, 16 to 38. That'd be the Ashkenazi custom. And it'd be the same portion in the book of Ezekiel 36, verses 16 to 36. There's two verses short in the Sephardic custom. Uh, and like I said, the Psalm would be Psalm 75. For and I, and I, I go over that just so that people will have an idea of the have other readings and see what they could extract from the other readings in relationship to the regular sidra and the seasons. Um, when the, the rabbis set it up like that, they had in mind either a particular sidra and related to the sidra or related to the calendar year, what's going on with the seasons. And um, so you have uh, uh, those different um, differences that um, occur from time to time. So now, the, the Sidra being Kitasa itself, which, which, which um, will, um, we translate most times in, in most books, as I read in the beginning, it said, and the Lord spoken to Moses saying, when I'll take it to some of the children of Israel according to their number. Uh, then shall they give every man a ransom for a soul unto the Lord. When thou numbers them, that there be no plague among them, and thou numbers them. All right, so now, what's interesting, um, you got to say, well, if I'm counting the individual, why should it be a plague? You know, and, it's, and it doesn't stop there. Um, uh, you're going to count not actual the persons, but they're going to actually count later on as we find a half shekel. All right, and, and, and one of the things say a half a shekel, and why that? As a, as in, in the rich, not supposed to get more, and the poor should not get less, but a half shekel of silver. So, um, and is that saying you're half a man? So that bears a lot of discussion. There's a lot of um, debates and views in reference to that, but. I like to go into the Hebrew part and and look at it as it as it states in the Hebrew um, in the same verses. It said, "Why did Adonai El Moshe lemor?" Right, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, "Ki tsa et rosh v'nei Yisrael lefukot hem when when not no ish kapir nafsho." All right, Adonai. All right, so so now, when it, but but what's interesting is that I want to focus on. Ki tisa et rosh, right? It count the heads, or right. but the tisa itself don't not really is in a sense we use it as counting, but it also means to lift up, uh, you know, raise and elevate, right? Tisa itself is a word that's similar to that we say nasa, which means to lift up. Everybody that know uh, Cape Canaveral, they had this place, the space thing called NASA, and what they do is they rock us up. But it's a strange thing used for counting. And then when it said lift up the heads of the individual, but yet you count in shekels, then it's, a, it's something to discuss. You know? And we're only talking a half a shekel per person. Um, and then how do you make a half a shekel in, in, in that area? We know people just stamp stuff on things like that. 
but very few people will walk around with a half a shekel. So something had to be uniquely made. So that's something to consider. And then um, we know in this particular portion, and I'm come back to it, if you exalt and lifting somebody up in recognition, then how you be lift up when we get into the, um, the, the most, atro the, the greatest atrocity in our history, which we're gonna find out later on was the sin of the golden calf. Um, we know it talks about in, the, in this particular portion of the book, you know, it, it goes on and talk about certain items. It talk about the uh, the law. You know, the, you know, the, we just finished with the altar incident in, in the previous um, sidra, but now it's talk about the lava of brass. You know, and the, the lava of brass. You know, and and then it goes on and talks about the holy anointing oil, and then it talks about the composition thereof, uh, and then it goes and talks about the the the, the actual uh, people who are going to work on it. But let's look at the, the the holy anointing oil. And we talk about the, 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 the lava of brass. Why is that so essential? When we heard about the oil, we read about the altars, but now, how come only now we hear about a lava or wash basin of brass? And that's for the, the Kohanim to wash his hands and feet anytime he began his service and, uh, you know, uh, coming out and entering the, the sanctuary. He must uh, wash his hands and his feet, you know, and that, and that lava. And the Kohanim, we read about the outfits of the Kohanim. Kohan don't, don't have any shoes supplied for him. And he got the, you know, and uh, so going from one area to another area, he must wash not only the hands, and uh, uh, but the feet. Now, it's always a Kabbalist, Kabbalistic view. I, I don't like to go into that when I'm speaking in a viewpoint like this, because uh, I leave it for those that's far better, and also that it, it takes more extensive discussion. But they, and just but in a nutshell, you have 10, 10 fingers, 10 toes, and it's supposed to reminiscent of the, uh, the Sephiroth, you know, from, uh, from head to toe. The way you walk and the way you operate, you know, you, you know, you operate with your hands, you walk with your feet, and and so it's supposed to be a reflection of something to that um, that level. But meanwhile, I just want to, you know, I'm just I'm passing through in that area there. I'm not going to peruse deep into that area there and speaking on that. Um, but I like to bring out that when it, um, it talks about all the sacrifices and stuff like that. Uh, you know, it should be uh, you know, offered with salt, and you know we already know in wine libation. Uh, but the, the incense, the perfume, the incense that's, that had basically they deduce that it had eleven different spices that made up this incense. Um, we're not really sure what all the eleven is. You got a whole lot of debate about some of the items that's mentioned in the book because. Um, we, you got to look at that the temple was destroyed for close to 2,000 years. So if the temple was destroyed close to 2,000 years and people started writing and it still was pale compared to the, the original temple, there's a lot of things that the Temple of Solomon had that it focused on that we don't really see and focus on in the temple after they came back from Babylon. Especially with the delay in the, in the in the process of how it was built, restructured, re-edified by Hiram, and things of that um, sort. So now, as we look uh, look um, in the thirty first chapter, it says, "And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hor, of the tribe of Yehuda, and I have filled him with the spirit of God and wisdom." and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise skillful works to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones for setting and in carving of wood to work in all manner of workmanship. And I have, and I behold, have appointed with him a holy op, the son of Akisamah of the tribe of Don. And in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom 
that they may make all that I have commanded thee. All right, so now, these, and it's named two unique individuals. So, uh, and when you go into the names, you know, just, just dealing with the first name, uh, Bessel, you know, which means, you know, uh, it's basically in the shadow of my, uh, in the shadow of God or in the shadow, sometimes it's in the shadow of his father, looking at his father's name and understanding the meaning of his father's name. A holy out, you know, is, a, is the tent of my father, but they're working on a tent. And they have some unique skills. And you notice that the creator, if he gives you the vision, he makes the provisions. You know, so the thing is that these guys, some people think that they didn't have any skill. But when you look at it, it said he filled them. So they had some skills already. But he enhanced the actual skills that they had in order to do the, the, the work that's necessary. And, but the first thing he endowed them with, especially with uh, Basel, it says, I have filled them with the spirit of God. Because sometimes people have the skill, but they don't have the willing heart. And I'm sure most of us be around other areas, but if not the workplace, the, in different congregations that you say you worship in, and the burden of running a congregation, the burden of, you know, <clears throat> enhancing uh, the place that you dedicate, that you're going to send your prayers up to worship in, is left to only a handful of people. And many of the people that don't lend a hand, uh, not because they don't have the skill, not that because they have the wisdom to do certain things, not that they don't have the understanding, they just doesn't have that spirit of God in them to say, well, what should I be contributing? Shouldn't I want to contribute my part? To the service to enhance this bill. So this is one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, I, I found throughout my, you know, little tenure, you know, you know, around Israel, and even in um, different synagogues, the Jewish synagogues as well, that it's very few people that is actually committed to actually put hands on and deal. Some people will give money and say, look, uh, uh, and I'll pay my money. Don't ask me for nothing else. I'm not doing anything. But you pay the money to be left alone, or you pay the money to help establish something and support it. And just handing the money, the or, or, or you know uh, material stuff to support something, and not saying if I can lend a hand. When you when you lend a hand, that's when you really give of yourself, giving. A coin here and there is not necessary of yourself. You know, that sometimes you, people pay how things to be left alone. So, um, and we got to do much better, all of us, in those areas. We got to, uh, one of the, one of the uh, presidents of this country uh, that was assassinated said, ask not what your country could do for you, but, but ask what you could do for your country. Then that's what we should be doing all of us that have a mind to try to uh, be, bring more godliness and holiness to this world and say, what role can I play and assist? So these guys had certain spirit is already upon them and God named two of them exceptional that he even enhanced their skill. And, that, and it goes to show that everybody else that had natural skills to do that. So they wasn't the only craftsmen, but these was the premier. So now you got to say, well, why he chose those two? And you, um, as we know, Bethel is out the tribe of Judah, which is the largest tribe. And, you know, Aholiah is from the tribe of Don, which is the smallest tribe. So you got one from the greatest tribe and you got one from the least tribe. And it, it takes both of them working together with other people assisting and supporting them to make this happen. So, um, <clears throat> We're gonna. Um, I'm gonna move on from that, and just going to um, the 15th verse of that 31st chapter. It says, Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. 
Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day, he ceased from work and rested. So now, and the English should be uh, misleading a lot of a lot of times, and we'll get to that 15th verse in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in 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 the English. And um, what, 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 uh, one of the problems is that when we get to the 15th verse in English, you know, um, uh, I mean, it's part of a, a prayer we say um, every you know every Shabbat, basically, you know, and then. Um, and, and, it's, and, and, uh, and it says, you know, Rosham Menu Ben Israel, Ed Ha Shabbat. The children of Israel shall observe the Shabbat. You know, La So, Ed Ha Shabbat. Right? That means, you know, you know um, and, um, and it goes on to say, throughout your generations. Um, and, you know, but, but it says, Bari uh, Olam, you know, you know, forever. A covenant forever. It's a covenant, of, um, a, a covenant forever. Right? But, when we get down here to the last part of uh, the 17th verse, it says, Ubayom um, Hashibi'i, Shabbat Wayi Nafash. All right. And, you know, in the day, in the seventh day, you know, Ubayom, you know, Ubayom Hashibi'i, in the seventh day or on the seventh day, uh, Shabbat Wayi Nafash. The creator used the word Shabbat means he rested, you know, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean you know, as far as the people say it rest, the tongue of the people rather, excuse me, means that they rested on the Shabbat and be refreshed, your soul, your soul itself is, is, is saying that's for your soul <laughs> uh, to be refreshed. So a lot of times people think to go to sleep on Shabbat, I'm, 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 doing, I'm resting, it says rest. It's not that kind of rest that it's talking about. Um, it's talking about a different type of rest. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I'm sure you got a lot of different teachers to explain that. And when we go to the book of Genesis, you see that same term used, you know, for us, what the creator did when he talked about, you know, you know, he ceased from, you know, his work and used the word Shabbat there. So um, for those brothers and sisters that, Figure they just stay home, stay home, stay home. I don't feel like going out. It's too windy. <clears throat> uh, the weather's in climate, or it's too hot, or I didn't get enough sleep. All those things there, uh, they tally up. But even, but it's mentioned here. Interesting, it's mentioned here after they're given instructions to build the Mishkan. So when they're given the instructions to build a Mishkan at this particular junction. And said, look, don't, don't forget about the Shabbat. Just like when we was given command concerning Damana, don't forget about the Shabbat. All right. So only here it says that the Shabbat shows that it's a relationship between me and the children of Israel. Anybody else, you know, they can observe it. But it's a special bond. If you claim to be an Israelite, or in some circles people say Jew, Jewish, you know, it's a special bond in reference to that. And the Shabbat day never changes. You know, we used to have a saying in Ben Zaykin where I come from, that, you know, the Shabbat was a day in the days of old, you know, and it was divinely taught. It was the last in creation, but the first in thought. And uh, man was not made for the Shabbat, but the Shabbat was made for man. So those are some of the things that we used to teach in, um, in, in the school I grew up under. So now we're going to go into the, the 32nd. Uh, well, before I, uh, oh, I, I, I'm going to finish the 18th, 18th verse, which is very important to what I got to convey. And then 31st uh, verse, 18th verse, uh, 18th verse, 30, 31st chapter, excuse me, 18th verse. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of speaking with him upon Mount Sinai, two tablets 
or two tables of the testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. So it's specified here in this writings here that God actually did some writing and God provided the material, the stone, the tablets here. And that's important to know because we're gonna have, um, I'm gonna just bring out just a couple of points in, uh, in, in, um, in our downfall. The 32nd chapter, now this is where things get pretty rough. The 32nd chapter said, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, up, make us a guard who shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we know not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, break off the golden rings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and shall, you know, and bring them unto me. And all the people broke off the golden rings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. Um, I'm reading this here uh, because I want to um, bring out some certain points in here. And then, and then it goes to say, and they received it at their hand, and fashioned it with a graven tool and made it a molten care. And they said, and they said, this is thy God, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation saying, and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morning, morrow, and offered a burnt offering and brought peace offering. And the people sat down to eat, to drink, and rose up to make merry. All right, they use a strange word there in, a, in that sixth verse. Um, let me see, 34, sixth verse. Okay. 32nd, that sixth verse, yeah. Uh, oh, well, not, not, uh, it's further down, excuse me. Uh, it's, it's further down. All right, we'll get to it, uh, which is uh, for a while. All right, and uh, you know, when Moses saw it, I'm, I'm going ahead of myself, trying to be, sure, be quick. All right, <clears throat> so one of the things we got to look at, and, 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 and I'm not going to spend a lot of time, I'm sure a lot of people honed in on this here in most places where they had teachings on it, is that they less than seven weeks afterwards, they got impatient. What do we find is that Moses delay. If somebody delayed, that means you have an idea they told you about when they're going to come back. So that's something to think about. If they found out that Moses delayed, then that means automatically you didn't make it, you didn't make it back to your appointment on time. Now, normally in military and different places, and something that's very serious, we say just synchronize the watches. So did we synchronize the time? Did Moses and the people synchronize the time correctly? And then we find here that they rose up to Aaron, and we know automatically that Aaron and her was left in charge of the camp while Moses went up the mountain. <clears throat> so Joshua wasn't near the, near the camp. He went part way with Moshe, with Moses, but he wasn't near the camp. And who was left in charge of the camp was her and Aaron. All right, that's the grandfather of Bethel we just read about. And it's always what happened to him? Most commonly, they say he was murdered. That's the most common. But they addressed Aaron, and both of them had the authority to make decisions and guide him in Moses' absence. So we, that, that's something to think about and saying, well, what kind of crowd we have, we're talking about here that approach Aaron? And then what is interesting to notice is that we don't have any... Um, identification, it says said, you know, people in general. They didn't say children of Israel. 
And then, the, and, and then what's even um, dynamic is that when they approach Aaron, if you believe that they already got violent with the, the other guy and Aaron's the only one left to talk to, um, and break the earrings, take the earrings from your, your sons and your daughter's ears and your wife's ears and bring it up. So now you read where they took the earrings, you know, and brought their earrings that they took out their own ears. Not their wives. So, you know, and not even their children. They left from Egypt pretty well off. So now what we find here is not only as they say a failure to communicate, but we find here that you find that men are more involved in this situation. And I'm just gonna go fast forward and you know say that the women is not really taking part in this action. Because they talk about they took the earrings out their ears and Eric gave them a direct order to you know take it out of your you know your wife here, you know and and most of it, and then when we track a lot of stuff in our history in the wilderness and I'm just gonna say this just to move on a little bit because I know this is gonna be a little, little lengthy and and um, I, and I ask you to explore it a lot more because so many different social issues that develop here is that when we check out our history in the wilderness. We don't read not one time, Mark, what not one time that women step out of line. You know, and, that, and you find that kind of strange. <clears throat> you find it kind of strange. Now we know Korah, you know, you know, his household went down and Nathan and Byron, their whole household went down. That means children, young ones, wives, and all that kind of stuff. But I'm saying as the female populace throughout the 40 years, only female you find remarkable, you know, re remotely stepping out of a position for a moment was Miriam. That's the only one. And she just said a couple of things, but she still was held in high esteem, but she said a couple of things and she paid, you know, dearly for the things she said. But outside of that, for 40 years, can you imagine that the women was not involved in all these different atrocities. And you, know, you make the same, mm. Moses told the man when they got the, the, the sign of Mount Sinai, I spoke earlier, that the men stay away from their wives. They didn't have to tell the women to stay away from the men. Don't you find that kind of strange? Especially when God never told them to tell the women that, that we read about in the scriptures. All right, so. Those are some of the things, you know, I know I like to focus on um, and, and, and show. Now, when they talk about the people and they said, this be your gods of Israel, it's like, I'm an outsider pointing to you, you know, and saying that this be your God. So I'm acting like, I'm acting like a third person. I, and uh, so I'm saying, this be your gods, not necessarily mine. Your gods, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Aaron, if you made a calf, and he fashioned a calf at that particular time, the calf is already made. Why delay the feast to the Lord to the next day? If the calf is already made, and you already did what you need to do and satisfy them, and they said, this be your gods, and Aaron said, the feast of the Lord be for tomorrow, then did Aaron believe in the calf? We know he didn't believe in it. You know, the people didn't believe in the calf. And was the calf was to replace God or replace Moses? So those are some of the things, you know, we're going forward. And I, I'm just going to bring a couple more things in reference to that. And, um, I, you know, I always employ people to, to read over it, you know, you know, extensively. I, uh, one of the things we read about um, in reference to that, that they created such a great sin is that, oh, let me see here. I'm gonna skip down, just bring out a couple more points. All right. All right. All right, and in, 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 in that same chapter, all right, and Moses turned and went down from the mount with two tables of testimony in his hand and the tables that were written on both their sides on, on the one side and on the other 
where they were written. And the tables were the works of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven on the tables. All right. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome. But the noise of them that sing do I hear? And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the care and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hand and broke them beneath the mouth. All right. And we know, you know, well, what happens after that. But, uh, but, uh, but that's not what I want to focus on in this point here. You know, we always have the same when he, and, and Benny Zaykin said, who broke all the commandments at one time? You know, and we say, Moses, because, because this particular um, thing to do it, they tap this down. But, uh, but the 21st verse, um, in the 21st verse, he said, he made the children of Israel drink of it, uh, of the water when he burnt and powdered it up. Moses said unto Aaron, what did this people unto thee that thou hast brought a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, then not the anger of my Lord be wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on evil. So they said unto me, make us a God which shall go before us for as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we know not what is become of him. So, uh, and I'm going to stop there, you know, pretty much and go into the Psalms after this, but I'm going to um, have people go back and read just um, pretty carefully um, that when we go over this area, Moses saying, that's not you, Aaron. I know you. You ain't, you ain't made, yeah, I mean, you ain't that kind, you don't have that kind of spirit to talk about, you're going to worship an idol. That's not you. God communicated with you. That's not you. So how would you do this here? I mean, the people had to do something for you to bring, and you notice that bring a sin upon them. So you compound not only the wrong that they did, but you compound the wrong that you did because you caused somebody else to do wrong. So Moses said, what they do to you first to try to deflect a little bit and get consideration to his older brother because he looking at him realizing that's not you. And a lot of times we could take a lesson, life lessons from that. One of the life lessons is that when a, a brother or sister mess up and do things that's unseemly, then you can say, wow, what's going on with them? Him or her? Because that's not them. Something must have possessed them. Something must have took over them because that's not their heart of hearts. That's not their true character. And, and, that's, and so this is how you sometimes begin to rebuke an individual by reminding not only the individual, but also digging down within yourself and realizing that that's not the individual. That's not his true makeup. That's not what he really desired. And that's the only way a person could begin to want to repent is when you realize that that's not their real desire and that's not really them. All right. So um, anyway, as you know, I just want to go with that. Um, Moses went up in the mountain, you know, and, um, and you, you know, it's in the end of the Sidra. I just want to bring out the point the end of the Sidra. And I'm going to skip all the way to uh, we got the 13 attributes in the 34th um, well, well, when, when, well, in the 33rd chapter, you know, when, you know, when, when 17 first, when Moses asked to see God's glory and everything. And he, um, so, and God put him in a cliff of the rock. So that bears a lot of discussion. That's said every time, you know, we, we, you know every Shabbat, we say that the particular uh, part there and on special holy days. I, you know, Adonai, Adonai, El Rakum, you know, so we say that regular. And going into the 34th uh, chapter, uh, it, it, um, it, it talks about as we, as we end, as we begin to end, get to the very end of it. Um, 
Okay. And um, I'll start from the 32nd verse. And after all the children of Israel came nigh and he gave, and he gave them commandments, all that the Lord had spoken with him in the mount. And when Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went before the Lord, that he might speak with them, he took the veil off. So up further in that same chapter, when Moses brought the, uh, you know, um, and I, I better read that because um, a lot of people, I, have, I always had to go back over the story. And the Lord spoke, uh, said to Moses, write down these words, for after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. Right. And he said there, uh, and, and, and he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. Did He did eat, neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tab, t t tables the words of the covenant, the 10 words. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of the testimony in Moses' hand. When he came down from the mount, that Moses knew not that his skin of his face sent forth beams while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face sent forth beams, and they were afraid to come nigh him and was called unto them. And Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses spoke to them. All right, now, most people believe Moses only went up to the mountain, or, you know, three times. I mean, twice. Excuse me, twice. But he actually ascended and did that 40-year, I mean, 40-day bid of not eating and drinking before the presence of the Creator three times. The first time, everybody see that clearly, he came down with the first set of tablets. The second time, when he went up there, he went to pray, not only uh, and ask for forgiveness and get this revelation, what we read about in the Cliff of the Rocks before God. Then, you know, he um, after the, after God's forgive him, that's when God tells him to go get a second set of tablets. And bring them and call them up and bring them up like the first and call them right, right upon them. Now, in this particular portion here, it's hard to, to see that, and we won't, uh, we tend to miss it until we look into Deuteronomy, the ninth and tenth chapter. And we're going to the Deuteronomy, ninth and tenth chapter. He explains the times that he went up. He explains the first time is never a question, but after the sin of the golden calf, why would he bring, and I'm not bringing this up to, just in case people don't decide to go and look and, and I really pay attention. Uh, why would he bring a second set of tablets after he broke the first? When he was never told to break the first, but he did it because th the contract wasn't delivered. So there's a lot of discussion about why he broke it and was it beneficial and did he help Israel or not help Israel? All right. Did he save and make diminish their their um their their atrocity less or, or, or you know or, or whatever? There's different a lot of discussions on it. So um then if you're going to pray for a particular people, uh, you're going to pray for a particular people at the time. Um, then how are you going to bring up something? And say, oh, give me another set of uh, tablets like the other ones. I broke them because I was I was angry. Not that I got word, I was angry. So I broke them, you know, because the people infuriate me. And then you got to ask this particular question. Didn't the creator said the people already went astray? So the, the people told Moses that they already went astray. Why didn't Moses believe God? God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of a man that he should repent. So could, could it be that Moses believed God, but he didn't think it was bad as it was sound coming from God? That's a human being. You know, Moses is a human, a human being. 
And Moses got upset. When God was upset, Moses then evidently take it that serious. Now when he saw it, he becomes seriously upset. And now when he goes in and he read and when you read later on in Deuteronomy 40 years later, that he had to pray for Aaron and the people at that time. And that's when he had, after he did the 40 days of praying for Aaron and the people, then he came back down. So the first time when they say he delayed, Moses is written here that he didn't delay. He left when God stopped speaking to him. He was dismissed. He didn't leave abruptly. He didn't stay overtime. He was dismissed once God stopped speaking to him. Was that a sign that I don't need to talk anymore? Because I'm, I mean, you got the tablets right here. I supplied it, I wrote on it. You know, you're going down there. I'll tell you what's going on. So could it be that that's why he may have had to do 40 days? We don't know. We could discuss a whole lot of areas in reference to that. But um, I just want to highlight some of the points there and in uh, and, and reference to uh, Moses. And, and, um, and one of the things is that we used to say patience is a virtue. The people became impatient. They sent Moses they delegated Moses. They didn't want to hear from God, and they sent them up there, and therefore they got impatient because he ain't coming back at the time they figured out. So there's a lot of stuff going on, but we're going to go straight to the Psalms because I'm running behind time a little bit for what I'm going to do. So we go to Psalms 75, and... Um, and, and those people to go over the half torals, uh, you know, I spoke on, you will see a reference to uh, how it's related to this particular subject. So Psalms um, 75. We're in the book of Psalms, chapter 75, verse 1. Hallelujah. You can hear me, Prince? Yes, I hear you well. Hallelujah. Psalm 75. It reads, um, Lam nach na, naset ak al tashket mismor le asaf shir. For the leader, al tash tashket, a psalm of asaf, a song. Right. We give thanks. So now, some, mm -hmm. some, some people think it's a uh, he's actually, um, uh, you know, a, a, a prophet. You know, sometimes they refer to different prophets that, um, you know, and, and different psalms. You know, according to some of the um, commentaries. And you know, when I say commentaries, I'm saying readers and rabbis at the time. So, and they base it on the name and the meaning. Go ahead. We give Second thanks verse. unto thee, O God. We give thanks, and thy name is near. Men tell of thy wondrous works. All right there. All right. It, why talk about giving thanks to God twice? You know, because one, you know, what I mean, you're thanking God, you know, for Him is is existing, you know, and then it goes on to talk about you know thank uh, God because He's also near us. See, a lot of times people have this concept that God created the world and stepped away from the world and left us to ourselves. He had nothing else to do. Once he did the work, he stepped out of the creation that he did and, and to have no more involvement within the creation or the creatures that, 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 that he made. But that's not so with our God. So, so therefore, this is some of the testimony when a person recognizes and want to make a change in their life, make a repentance in their life. It's sort of like a repentance type psalm that's going on, which is only basically 11 verses. Uh, continue. <clears throat> Verse 3. When I take the appointed time, I myself will judge with equity. Hold right there. Hold right there. All right. When I take the appointed time, in the, in the Moe, you know what I mean? We're talking about the Moe. Uh, and, and, and one of the things is that, you know, Moe is an appointment, and, and God makes those appointed time. So I'm, I'm just going to share... A little story, you know, the sidebar story. 
it was a uh, it would well, be true to if it's true the sidebar story as a judge that was um uh dealing with a case and he judged the case and the, uh what happened was the guy was a a, a murderer and the guy was a murderer and, and since the guy was a murderer you know the judge was going to condemn him you know to the most severe punishment so what happened was because the way the the trial went and it was some mis handling of certain um, things in the trial, the guy got off free in the court. And the judge said, you know, one day that you're going to have a wiser judge than me, though I know you're guilty. So you will, you, you, you allow the leave legally, but you will not escape justice. So that's why sometimes we always wonder why people get away with so much crime, you know, and move on and move on and move on and see like nothing happened. But this some, you know, God's appointed time, not in your time. And things could be legal in the system, but it may not be just according to God. And a lot of times we being in America understand about legalities as opposed to justice. And we got to always deal with justice if we're going to be godly, you deal with legalities if you want to just be dealing with the normal men of society. And a lot of legalities is corrupt. So that's what the, that's what the, um, the stated here. The, the, uh, the psalmist is saying that God will eventually mete out the true justice. And that means fair. Even though man may not be able to exercise it because you create laws where a guy can escape from certain crimes. All right, let's go, I'll continue. Verse four, when the earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved, I myself establish the pillars of it, Salah. I say unto the arrogant, deal not arrogantly into the wicked, right. lift not up thy horn. Lift not. Hold on, hold on, hold on. All right. Did we miss something? Go, forward, go from four again. Verse four. Yes. Go for four, uh, verse four, it reads, when the earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved, I myself established the pillars of it. Salah. I right, say. Right there. Okay. All right. Right. All, right. All, right. All, right. All right. Yes. So that's what I wanted to get, get in. So uh, the earth itself, when you say, you know, the creator, you know, in the song, so the speaker, the speaker speaking, like the, the creator set up a foundation in earth. So since he found, set the foundation in the earth that he know where the corners is, it will not be moved because he put it there. It's not a shaky foundation. It's not a weak foundation. So we know automatically that when people say, well, why this terrible earthquake? Why this terrible tsunami? Why this terrible um, fire? You know, and, uh, and then we could always tend to explain away certain things and, uh, and say, well, this is a natural disaster. It's a natural disaster, <laughs> you know, and that's what we like to, uh, you know, coin that phrase. This was a natural disaster, you know, ground opening up, tidal waves, tsunamis, fire, hurricane, natural disaster. Because we we rather explain away in the modern world why something coincidentally could happen. Do you think we're the first one to try to explain it away? How could... 10 plagues hit Egypt before they say, huh, look here, I'm done. Just three plagues, the third plague, the, the Egyptian magician said, this is the finger of God. He ain't, he ain't on his heart yet. He ain't on his heart yet, but this is just a finger of the creator. So we got to understand that, and this, this ties into the sin of the golden calf because um, some people think we got, we're going to get away. And, um, and um, one of the things, uh, well, I'll finish this and just bring that out. Hey, go ahead, continue. Verse five, five, it reads, I say unto the arrogant, deal not arrogantly, and to the wicked, lift not up the, the horn. Uh, keep going. Lift not up your horn on high. Speak not insolence with a haughty neck. For neither from the east nor from the west, nor yet from the wilderness cometh lifting up. 
Hold right there, hold right there. In other words, saying, you don't do this on your own. You might think you accomplished this. Empires come and go. We read about the Assyrian Empire. We read about the Babylonians. Where they at now? I mean, as far as power, you know? We read about the Persian Empire. What's going on with that? We read about the Greek Empire. What's happened to that? And we read about the Roman Empire. What happened to that? You know, and that's just some of the major empires that impact the world. We worry about the Mo Mongol Empire. Where's that at? You know, so we, 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 we read about, you know, I mean, the, the, the Spanish and the Portuguese running everything and colonizing all the part of the Africa. What happened to uh, Portugal and Spain now? So England, they used to brag and say the sun don't, uh, don't never set on England, the British, never Great Britain because they had colonies all around the world. All right? and they're still uh, somewhat of a superpower, but they're not an empire like they was you know, at one time. So most people, the creator letting us know through the song, you know, through the song rather, the psalmist letting us know through the song that though a person might have an empire and may rise up again, and they say, I think I did it on my own. I planned this. I set it up. I accomplished this. Anything, we have free will. But the creator has the last say. We got to remember that. Though we have free will, the creator got the last say. All right, continue. Eight. Verse 8, it reads, For God is judge, he putteth down one and lifteth up another. Hold it, right? That means right in there that <clears throat> you think you accomplished this? Say no. Your time is up. You didn't do right. You got to go. Somebody else taking over. And so that means that the creator, the psalmist, and the people know that the creator is still running things, running things. We think that we run things. One of the things I always say from the Genesis story is that once God made man, man been making God ever since. The idea of what a God is. All right, let's continue a few more verses. Verse 9, it reads, For in the hand of Jehovah there is a cup with foaming wine full of mixture, and he poureth out of the same. Surely mm -hmm. the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth shall drain them and drink them. Mm -hmm. But as for me, I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked also will I cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be lifted up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let you know that it's no getting away. It's not even a shadow of a turning with the, with the creator. When we look at the, um, this episode, this dark chapter in our history of the uh, of the Chay Egel, the Chay Egel is the sin of the golden calf. Uh, one, we don't even get a tough animal. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's an image. We, we, get, we get an animal that, that, that need to be nurtured. That, that's uh, automatically the mind is not there. You don't even get a tough one. I mean, like a bull, a lion, or, you know, I mean, something like that, a dragon. But, uh, they had a, you know, but one of the things is that you had only 3,000 people killed in that incident of the sin of the golden calf. 3,000. Can you imagine 600,000 men of war? That's not even 1% of the 600,000 plus men of war. Can you imagine that? And can you even bear in mind women wasn't part of that? That's even more insulting. So that, you know, so, and it brings out other things why Pharaoh figured women shouldn't be going to worship because it's usually not a man, it's not a, not a woman thing, it's supposed to be a, 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 a man thing predominantly in ancient times. So, um, but that's, that's the, you know, the ancient world. And, and um, like I said, so we got to be a lot more uh, thankful and mindful of what we do of you approach that particular time. And hence, that's why Shabbat Parah, uh, they talk about the, the 
the calf, the preparation of the calf uh, um, that you had to prepare when you get impure by the dead or any impurities, you know, you burn in ashes and stuff like that. And it was left, the first one was left under the, um, the authority of uh, Eleazar, the, the son of Aaron, to make sure it's done and burnt. And the ashes for purification, but the whole process makes you impure while you, you know, trying to produce this um, thing of um, purification. So hence, that's why they say the Shabbat uh, para, you know, in the sense that we ourselves got to think about how are we going to get pure and who's going to purify us and who we stand before. So I hope you got something out of what I said and um, any mistakes been my own and, and, and I, you know, and I, I, you know, please uh, go back over the sin on the golden calf. There's so much stuff in there, in that area, even with the, the, the 13 attributes and what is the glory of God and the things that he, uh, that, that's being portrayed here and mentioned is not only God identifying himself, but he's telling Moses things that he can relate to by understanding people, history, and the past when he passed before him. But uh, with that, like I said, Shalom Lekham, the early Shabbat Shalom. And any mistakes from my own. Hallelujah. Torah Abba Nasi. May the Most High God bless you. Shalom, Shalom. Um, blessed be the Most High forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen.